Um, I grew up uh, just about five miles away from here, uh, born and raised on a fifth generation family farm, and um, about, let's see, about 13 years ago it was, I graduated from high school, and probably like most other people my age, I couldn't wait to leave, so that's what I did. I um, studied um, undergraduate in St. Peter, Minnesota, and after that, headed out west to Boulder, Colorado, where I um, focused on my studies. I got a master's in geography and um, with immigrant and refugee populations. And I um, was really looking for ways that I could become involved in the nonprofit sector and helping um, new Americans get to the U.S., resettle and adjust culturally and get on their own two feet financially. Um, and at that time, which was uh, 2003, that's when Justin entered the picture. Yeah, we met at the very end of 2003. Uh, I was finishing up my undergraduate degree at CU Boulder uh, while Kathy was fin finishing up her graduate degree. Uh, we were both in the, in the geography program. And uh, at that point, we were, uh, I was getting ready to graduate and looking for something to do postgraduate. Um, uh, and where am I going with this? Um, we stayed on in Boulder about another two years uh, after graduating and uh, following that we took about a year off and then decided that we'd like to move to West Africa and work with the Peace Corps. And so that was something that we did. Uh, we applied to the Peace Corps and we were accepted uh, and we so that was in January 2008, um, after having lived a bit of the suburban life outside of Denver, um, Justin doing carpentry and myself working in the nonprofit world, um, decided we wanted to see some more and headed to West Africa. Mm -hmm. So we were, we were with the Peace Corps, volunteers of the Peace Corps for about two years um, in Niger, West Africa. Excuse me one second. Large landlocked country, um, quite dry in the Sahara Desert, and um, kind of put our past skills and knowledge to use. I served as an agricultural volunteer um, with in the community that we lived in, and Justin did natural resource management, so we were kind of closely aligned with our um, jobs and our missions, but we uh, lived in a quite rural village. It was actually uh, relatively large. They were probably close to 5,000 people in a village, but we were definitely out in the bush, off the grid, you know, no electricity, running water, any of those amenities. Um, but we moved in and learned the local language, and after months of stumbling around and learning Hausa was the language well enough, we started in working um, with our agricultural and natural resource management jobs and did a lot of work um, helping farmers try out improved seeds and do some vegetable gardening during their cold season. Um, millet and sorghum are their main crops there, so we helped with farmers cooperatives, getting some um, kind of local supplies, seeds, fertilizers, and equipment in the community so that it was there when it was needed. And my other my other main work was working with um, women's groups and animal husbandry activities, starting buying small groups of goats, for example, and starting group savings accounts and working together um, at kind of a household level to improve quality of life. And Justin was more involved with the schools. Yeah, there was a, a primary school in our village. Uh, it had roughly 350 kids in it. And we started a tree nursery there. Um, a small garden and tree nursery uh, in which uh, we worked with a lot of the kids and learned how to collect seeds and, uh, and plant seeds and then propagate the seedlings. And um, we, we, we transplanted some just within the schoolyard and then we also sold some of the seedlings to, um, to the, the local people within the village. And uh, it was just a good way to learn how to produce some added extra income from the, the resources that people had locally. Um, and just a good way to 
um, to reforest the area. It's, it's, a, it's an area that's really heavily hit by deforestation and um, it's very dry, sandy soils. Um, so it's very hard to get things to grow um, and so just as an added um, way to be able to increase food security and, and household income, we um, work with the, the school kids and, and did the tree nursery. Um, we also did, uh, we built improved cook stoves. We worked with people, did, did you mention that? Um, and so we learned just how to use uh, the, res the few res resources that they did have more efficiently. Um, and yeah, just did a lot of culture sharing um, as well. That's, that's uh, one of the big goals of Peace Corps is culture sharing. Um, sharing our culture um, with the local people and then sharing the culture of the local people with, uh, with our friends and, and family back here in the States. Yeah, and that, so that brought us to the end of 2009 when we uh, re, we moved back to the States um, right at the end of that year. Arrived home in time for Christmas and basically looked at each other and said, now what? <laughs> so we knew we had some um, kind of big decisions to make in terms of our next steps and our next goals in life, where we wanted to go with that. So... Yeah. That's ultimately what led to us sitting here right now. Um, we really appreciated the close-knit community that we had while we served in Niger. Um, living in a rural area, uh, lots of wide open space and knowing your neighbors. Those are all things that I grew up um, in my childhood as well and had definitely come to appreciate and had missed since I'd left home. Um, and for Justin, it was something that he kind of realized he, he really enjoyed since living in Niger. Living in Niger was kind of his first experience with that, having grown up in the suburbs of Niger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and another thing I really appreciated was that 100% of the communication was done face to face. There was some people do have cell phones, but, um, you know, 99.9% .9 Communication's done face to face, and people are held accountable for for what they do, and um, and it was just amazing to see how little crime there was, um, and how little dishonesty there was. Um, it was just we've never felt so safer anywhere in our lives, um, but yet it's on the surface of it, the average Westerner would just be very very hesitant to to go um, and to walk down the street. But you know, once we were there. I really, um, I really felt like a part of the part of the family, and so I think that kind of is what drew us back to this area, is because it is, um, it is an area, one of the few sort of remaining areas, if you will, that where a lot of the communication is still done face to face, and people, um, you know, there's a lot more accountability, I think, because everyone knows who you are, so you can't, you can't, um, you can't do things dishonestly, or you're not going to be able to make a living. You'll, you'll. You can't live in this area and be be dishonest because people know who you are and they know um, the way that you you operate and so you have to be have a certain level of uh, of integrity if you will. So I think that's something that kind of drew us to the area because we wanted we wanted that um, to be a part of of our you know daily lives. Yeah, and moving back to family, of course, and to your family roots. That's something that a lot of um, a lot of families still have here, been here for generations and generations, maybe since their you know, ancestors moved from parts of Europe to here. And something that's, I think, quite unique um, for a lot of families in this generation, and I think for our generation as well, um, to still be you know, physically in the same location that your ancestors were when they came um, was really meaningful to us. and. Um, meant that we really felt like we wanted to continue on with the traditions, you know, their lifestyles and their values that they began. So Yeah, I think it's a it's a generational knowledge that's way too quickly lost is kind of, is my feeling about it and it's it's so easy you can you lose it so easily in one generation and it just takes multiple generations to gain that back. And so it's you know, I think we're sort of I guess somewhat subconsciously, but also partly consciously just trying to keep the tradition alive, um, you know, we keep, you know, our family keeps um, beef cows and um, and chickens, you know, laying hens, and so there's a lot of knowledge that goes along with that um, that you wouldn't necessarily 
think think of, but you know, that's really um, something that I've always really marveled at is how much knowledge it does take. Um, so I don't, yeah, that's something that I appreciate about the area. People are resourceful and thrifty, and um, and that's just sort of a a character trait that seems to be slowly but surely disintegrating. I guess as people like. Um, go more into sort of a conspicuous consum consumption kind of attitude. Um, so that brings us to early 2010. Um, knew that we wanted to live here and then came the decisions of trying to figure out what it was we were going to be doing mm -hmm. <laughs> and how we were going to make a living doing that. So my family's um, farms organic commodity crops, and that was just an avenue, I guess, that um, would have been difficult for us to get into, given the really expensive price of farmland right now. Um, and on top of that, it just wasn't especially, it didn't especially pique our interest. We were both quite, um, I don't know, I guess you might say social people, and we really enjoy interacting with others, and so we were... Um, quite attracted to the idea of value-added businesses and direct-to-market kind of activities, selling directly to consumers, and really trying to find our niche in, in the organic and the local food systems in Minnesota, which I think is definitely growing, um, slowly but surely becoming more popular, and the opportunities in that are growing, so we thought if we could work with our family and do more with our existing land, do more with what we already had. That was really um, what sounded uh, most interesting to us. Um, my parents, you know, have put in so much work to keep the family farm for starters and going, transitioning to organic was kind of one of those um, reasons that, or one, one of the reasons I, that I'm sitting here today I think as well because um, by nature, just going to organic kind of meant um, being more creative in a lot of ways and um, trying to diversify. So the um, camelina oil that we're selling now was one way to add value and diversify the farm's income. So... Hmm. I'm interested in the business, but I want to push back on the story to your reason for leaving. Your your the 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 spirit you had when you fled this area for, I mean, and for for graduate school ultimately for 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 a kind of intellectual life for a much broader horizon. Can you say a bit about what you were looking for in that uh, that venture outward? And what what you were imagining a good life or a satisfying life or a meaningful life to be like in that as as you left? Yeah. Well, I was eighteen and I just graduated, and I think for what's true of probably most eighteen-year-olds who are leaving is that they've spent their entire lives here. They've grown up here and they know nothing else. And that right there in of itself felt a bit, um, felt limiting to me. And I I'd always kind of, kind of felt like I was a bit of a square pig in a round hole. And I knew that, you know, that leaving was just going to present more opportunities um, culturally in terms of diversity. Um, I grew up thinking I was never going to marry a farmer. <laughs> it felt isolating, I think, the lifestyle in a lot of ways. Um, it just wasn't, working with my hands and in the dirt just wasn't something that I valued at that age. And I suppose for a lot of kids growing up on the farm, it's because you have to do that and you don't have an, an option otherwise. So what, what child doesn't, you know, naturally want to rebel against their parents at times? <laughs> so leaving, it, it just felt... Um, I, I, was, I was interested in studying business and geography and really just the diversity of the world, of the people and the landscapes. And that's what I was, I think, searching for when I left. 
and after undergraduate moving up to graduate school as well, I'd always had the urge in me to know that I wanted to get outside of Minnesota for a while. I had to experience something new and different. And I didn't know for how long and I didn't know for where, but um, there was something in me that told me you'll never regret trying it. You know, and I, and I did, I think, all along feel that ultimately I certainly liked the idea of eventually coming back and being closer to family. Um, and I was hoping that that was going to work out in the long run, but you know, I was just kind of going with it um, as it happened. Um, can you say just a word about your undergrad stuff? Sure. I, um, I studied in Gustav at Gustavus Adolphus in St. Peter, and I double majored in business management and in geography. And um, I, that, that's a you know, I guess a quite small college town and the student body at, when I was there was maybe 1,600 students. And so for someone coming from my background, that felt like a good transition to, you know, it was kind of like a giant high school in a way, I think, which for me was a good step up. And um, I, my interest really, I'm going to My interest really, um, just take it outside. One thing or another with these kids. Um, let's see. Your interest. My interest in geography was really piqued, I think, in studying um, at Gustavus, and that's what eventually led me to see Boulder. I, I went out um, there looking for a way to combine my two degrees, and what I Initially, I kind of thought was considering the site location for businesses and finding the best physical locations given the, the businesses, um, you know, their field, what are their products or their services. And at some point along in CU, I think maybe as I was discovering myself a bit more and my passions, I realized that. I wasn't interested in improving profits of businesses, I was interested in improving the quality of lives of people who maybe didn't have that opportunity, and so I did quite a 180 <laughs> in graduate school, which was um, a little difficult to do in a two-year master's program, you don't have much time for changing directions like that, but I did, and it, it just felt right um, the second that I walked in and kind of told my advisor of my you know, change of heart, and on my path. Sure. And is there, a, do you have a comparable backstory here? Um, I did my undergraduate degree uh, at CU Boulder in geography. Um, I did mostly physical geography um, as well as some cartography and map making. Um, and I knew I didn't want to have a nine to five office job. Um, and so I wanted to try to incorporate, you know, a little bit of both, you know, maybe some, um, some field, field study and field work along with perhaps some uh, computer-based or office-based uh, cartography or map making. And um, the route that I was going um, initially was uh, headed towards maybe a, like a federal land management agency, um, whether it be the the Bureau of Land Management or the Department of Wildlife um, or one of, one of the federal land management agencies I was um, intending on, on, uh, on doing something that route, but I ended up um, postgraduate getting a job building houses um, and doing carpentry and hands-on stuff. And that's really where my immediate, that's where I got the most immediate gratification from and that's where I could um, find a job most immediately as well. Um, and it was something that was in town, and um, at that point I had met Kathy, and so that kind of threw me for a loop. Um, and that was just about two weeks after I was set to graduate, and so that kind of uh, made me reevaluate the situation. And so I, um, I no longer really wanted to leave Boulder because Kathy was still um, working on her, her graduate degree. Um, and so that's, I guess, a bit of, of my background there as far as... Uh, as college goes. Has carpentry always been part of your life? Um, yeah, it has, kind of on and off. Um, my dad's always been a do-it-yourselfer kind of guy. Um, that wasn't his, his career. Um, 
but he, you know, on the weekends and stuff, he was a weekend, um, a weekend uh, project guy, and so he always appreciated at least having, you know, at least the basic kind of skills, um, and so, you know, in that way, I was um, just appreciated, yeah, him just doing as much as he could on his own, um, and I would always help him with whatever I could, uh, you know, growing up, ever since I was probably eight years old or so, I would, you know, always sort of be his, his right-hand man and, and help him with projects and stuff, and then it, um, I guess it really piqued my interest, um, after high school and into college, and then I started living on my own, and, um, started doing a bit more projects on my own, and just got a lot of satisfaction from it, and learned more, and, um, so yeah, I guess that's... So what's the genesis of the wooden toy end of this business? Yeah, well in October, uh, October 4th of 2010, our daughter was born, and uh, we had been here for a few months, we were, we had been here for about five or six months at that point, um, and at that point we were still really trying to figure out what it was that we were going to do to make ends meet, um, and when she was born we received quite a few gifts from um, a lot of our family and extended family and friends, and, um, and we just, it just kind of came to us, we thought maybe that would be a good idea for, um, for a business for ourselves, you know, it's considering um, my woodworking background and passion um, in, in carpentry, and Kathy had a business background in and, um, and marketing, and so we figured we could sort of put two and two together and, um, and try to make it work uh, selling wooden toys. And so that's how uh, Smiling Tree Toys was born. Yeah, and we've both always enjoyed handmade items especially, mm -hmm. and I've always appreciated making them, giving them, and receiving them. Mm -hmm. So it was, kind of began as a pipe dream of wouldn't it be great if we could just do that for a living and make, you know, make toys that people were going to mm -hmm. heirloom support kind of us in buying. Yeah, they were heirloom quality. And yeah. And I guess I always resented not having enough time to do, I didn't really want to do much outside of, um, outside of work you know, working with wood during work hours, I didn't really want to take much time outside of that to, to make stuff for myself or, or my friends and family as far as gifts went. Um, and so now that we were here, uh, unemployed for the most part, um, we just took that time to, to really start, um, to really start, you know, designing and making things um, the best that we knew how. So how, like, like what was the what was the timeline on this business? Uh, how long did it take for you to yeah. get up? <laughs> Probably yeah. six months or something like that, close to it, or um, three to six months maybe. Yeah, three four months probably of a long harsh Minnesota winter. <laughs> yeah, we've been and time inside. being able to devote that entire time um, having a little baby as well was obviously a, a time suck for us but that's about how long it took to really have our initial product line and have ourselves up online um, and ready for sale. Mm -hmm. So you're selling oil online and toys online? Yes. Yeah, yeah and two, two very different yep, yeah. two very different businesses mm -hmm. um, and the oil we're we do have online direct sales, but most of our sales are going wholesale to retailers who are then putting on their shelves. So, but it is all home based, and so basically, Justin's in the wood shop and I'm on the computer. Mm -hmm. um, and what kind of time does it take now that it's up and running? Um, well, it's been a it's a full time job for us. That's for sure. Um, Probably about full time and a half, mm -hmm. um, one and a half time. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, yeah, we're each putting in full time, you know, 40 or 50 hours a week. Yeah, I mean, Justin basically stays busy in the shop keeping, producing toys, and I, I do all of the 
basically everything else related to toys, all of the marketing and customer service and you know the accounting, book work, all of that. Um, and in terms of Omega Made in the Camelina oil, um, I guess I've taken on most of that and the marketing, um, advertising and sales part of that. And Justin um, and I both are involved with getting the oil to the press yeah. and bottling it yeah. and having that finished product ready to go. So in a lot of ways we're both giving about 100% times two, <laughs> which ends up to some really long days. Uh, so can you say just a bit about the, the marketing and the challenges of doing a business, uh, you know, from the country on an online business yeah. and marketing a new product and how, what what's what's it like? Um, I you know I off just with the availability of the internet and all of the e communications and everything in general I don't necessarily I don't feel very handicapped in terms of our physical location um, with our business. Um, it definitely has its disadvantages at times because we aren't located near a, you know, a metro area where there's large metropolitan population, and um, so whether it's going to sample at co-ops or trying to get our product to a distributor or going to, I mean, we don't have huge farmers markets that we can access nearby. We have to drive 150 miles to get to that large population base. So in that way, in terms of the oil, that's difficult. Um, when you're looking at it from the aspect of the wooden toys, our target market and our primary customer is not located near us either, I guess. Um, so again, it's the larger population bases and I suppose people with a bit more disposable income as well um, in more urban areas are also those customers looking and finding our toys. Um, but with the internet here, um, that's really what allows us to live here and be doing what we're doing, of course. And with, you know, quite in terms of logistics, the shipping, national shipping carriers service us, obviously. And so those kinds of things are just fabulous because we're able to still have this lifestyle that we've always idealized um, and live at a, certainly at a lower cost of living um, relative to urban areas, which has been helpful as small business owners who are starting up and trying to, you know, earn enough money to live off of. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, in a lot of ways for us, it's really the best of both worlds. We don't necessarily feel isolated um, just because we're, our businesses are able to take advantage of most opportunities that a business in an urban area can for the most part, but we're also able to have that lifestyle that we want. Mm -hmm. um, have you learned, in the course of putting this together, have you learned some things about how to do this kind of, of you know, rural-based business? Anything you'd pass on to your, to your, uh, mm -hmm. to the graduating, the graduates of Gustavus who might want to try this? <laughs> We've got any yeah. surprises is partly yeah. the question. Yeah. Yeah. Lots. I guess I'm just trying to put, think, it, put it into words. Yeah. I mean, I think in some ways, not that we... We're very proud of where we are living and our family farm and our background. But at the same time, um, the... I think anyway, the images that are conveyed on our websites about our businesses and um, our photographs, perhaps of our products, you don't necessarily equate that with maybe someone who's living in the, quite a rural area, you know, and so there's a bit of a, um, I don't know what the word is, quite a contrast maybe between um, people maybe wouldn't imagine the little white, you know, old farmhouse with character that we're living in. Um, and the, you know, kind of the look or the feel of the toys or uh, the specialty culinary oil coming out of it. Um, so I think in as much as you should be proud to tell your story and about where you're at and 
you know, working in and contributing to rural economies. At the same time, you need to take advantage and make the most of just presenting yourself in a professional, in a professional manner um, mm -hmm. and show people that you're really good at what you do. Um, and I, I guess I would say you have to be willing to work for free for a little while. Yeah. And that's something that's sort of a pill that's pretty tough to swallow. But it's true and that's um, not necessarily a freedom that some people have. Um, but I think that that's something that we learn that you kind of have to do. You have to be willing to work for more or less for, for free for a while just to be able to get you know, yourself and your business up off the ground um, because it's not going to pay immediately. Um, and I guess you also have, just have to be really willing to see the big picture and to see longer term because, right, you're not going to get, you're not going to be getting a paycheck every week. You know, you're not going to be getting a regular paycheck and so it's, it's not... Um, it's not the same as it as it is working a nine to five job, but um, I think a lot of those those things that you, you know you give up um, as far as the the regularity of a nine to five job, I think you make up for just in the, the quality of life that you that you can get around here, just being your own boss and um, you know determining your own schedule and and that kind of thing. And so I guess yeah, that's kind of would be my yeah. biggest. And as, as you're saying that too, I think one thing that comes to mind is, I mean, being creative um, is just a necessity for any small business owner, but I found, having grown up here, um, I think that when I moved back, somewhat in my mind, I was pretty sure that I knew everyone who was living here, and I knew exactly what everyone was doing, and I'm happy to say I was quite wrong in that way. So there's a lot of options, I think, in terms of partnerships, working with different suppliers or vendors that are around here that you might not know of, you know, when you first settle to a, a rural area like mm -hmm. this. So certainly taking advantage of those opportunities, um, but at the same time, realistically, you need to, you know, get your feelers out and you are going to have to be partnering and working with people who are hundreds of miles or several states away or other countries. So. I think there's a, a challenge, but also a great opportunity for rural, you know, your, your close local connections and partnerships, but also at the same time reaching out and, you know, taking what it is you need um, from kind of outside regions mm -hmm. as well. And then just the physical space. I mean, as far as what we do um, in our, our toy business, just having enough space to be able to do it, just physical space, is something that is much harder to come by living in a, an urban or suburban area. And so that's something that yeah. we literally would not be able to do if, if we lived uh, in an urban area just because we wouldn't be able to afford the space. Um, and then of course we would, just, you know, considering the higher cost of living, um, we probably wouldn't be able to make ends meet doing what we're now doing uh, if we were living in an urban area. Um, whereas here we are able to, to make it work because, um, you know, it's a lower cost of living and we have the, the resources locally to be able to do it and we have that infrastructure um, and so I think uh, you know just speaking um, speaking of opportunity and adding on to what Kathy said I think there there really is a, um, a lot of opportunity in a rural area for for people to start small businesses because you um, you have a chance to give yourself um, a bit more flexibility financially because you're not um, you're not spending as much money on your cost of living, and so you can put that money towards small, towards towards starting a business, um, and and I think that's something that uh, really inhibits people, at least as far as the startup goes, is they don't necessarily have the time and the money um, to do it, and so I think moving to a rural area really frees up both of those things really really well. So, are you still working for free? No, no not as much anymore. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, we're... Let's see. It seems like, um, as far as our Smiling Tree toys, right around a six-month mark or so was when things kind of started just selling themselves a bit more, and we felt like we were to a point where we were pretty close to just making ends meet. And that was something we were thrilled about, you know, that's a short time frame, I think, for a new business, um, and our 
our philosophy has also been to grow slowly and grow as we can afford it. So we we didn't take out a business loan to begin with, um, and had. I mean, Justin already had a good amount of equipment himself just from his past work experience, so that was certainly helpful. But, um, you know, we weren't quick to rush out to build a new shed, a new workshop where our toys were to be. Justin's working out of our single car garage. We didn't insulate, but maybe we should have, the wood shop for the first winter. <laughs> um, yes, we should. So Justin would agree we should have. <laughs> Um, so we're, we're taking steps as we can afford them, mm -hmm. and that's true of the oil as well. We don't own an oil press right now. We certainly wish we did so that we could press on farm, but for the time being, we... It's hard to justify the investment. Yeah, we, especially with a new product like Camelina Oil, we wanted to prove the market first, but we also wanted to, um, as we could afford it, purchase a press and a building and grow from there. So, am I understanding right that at the end of about six months, you're making it? Yeah, we started, yeah, and yeah. so I guess we should step back and say it was March of 2011 that we really, st we really launched the toy business, so it's been nearly a year and a half. Yeah. Um, so yeah, at approximately the six point, six month point um, is really probably when we started, um, you know, getting paid for our time, and then... Uh, three weeks ago, we hired a full-time employee at first, so that was sort of the, the, the second big uh, milestone, I guess. And in terms of the oil, um, we'd have to say we're, we're not making it <laughs> on there. We haven't seen financial rewards um, from that yet. Any money that, you know, our sales, which are modest um, thus far, the money's going right back into it to continue to yeah. grow. Um, but again, I, a lot of that I think for us is just the, um, the challenge we're dealing with of educating consumers and the grocery buyer about what this is to begin with and why it's good for you and why it's you know, a sustainable product to be growing and to be purchasing. You mentioned uh, kind of in passing the things you learned about your neighbors coming back. <laughs> yeah. The things you discovered were all around you that you hadn't paid attention yeah. to growing up. Can I hear a little more about that? It's kind of an sure. exciting area. I think so. And, it, and may, that may be true of just in the last generation as well, of other people like ourselves who are looking to do things like this. But um, one of the things that felt like a sign to us as we started our wooden toy business and moved out here was by some chance, Justin made a phone call and um, through maybe a couple degrees of separation, we realized that there was a man living here about, what, six miles away from us who has a sawmill. And out in the prairie. Right out in the it prairie, which, yeah. Yeah, you would never think. <laughs> Justin's first, I think, mm -hmm. words out of his mouth is, what's he doing in the middle of the prairie with a sawmill? <laughs> yeah, it just, it doesn't. Doesn't make sense. So, yeah, so for example, we can get some of our local black walnut wood. He's, you know, harvesting, oftentimes just salvaging from maybe farm sites that are being bulldozed under or other trees that have fallen. Um, and we're able to take that wood straight from him and use it, use locally produced wood, which is wonderful. And then we just kind of took that as a sign, because it was really serendipitous, and we kind of took that as a sign, and we said, you know, maybe this is something we should be doing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the other young couples we're finding who are our age, um, who have also done urban living, that seems to kind of be a, if you haven't grown up here your entire life, it's not common, it seems, to find a couple our age who, one of whom maybe has grown up here but left for a while, came back with a spouse, kind of got maybe a little disillusioned with the urban or suburban life that they had had. So there's other couples doing CSA as a community supported agriculture and, you know, vegetable market gardening or um, there's alpacas over here there's a family with, uh, yeah. with a small herd of alpacas That's true. Um, so it's sort of an alternative livestock <laughs> operation yeah um, one of our substitute mail carriers they have a herd of goats and they do um, they do goat's goat cheese. cheese you know so there's a lot of, of opportunity as far as that goes um, there's an abandoned little um, 
quite old bakery cafe in Lamberton near us that just was purchased the other day. A, a young couple, um, the woman of whom grew up here is a few years younger than myself, is moving back to open it and start their own little cafe. So it's it's trickling down, you know, and every time we hear of these stories, we actually came upon a local vineyard and winery two weekends ago when we were out on a drive. And every little one of those things just gets us a little more excited and um, really um, confident, I think, in the, the movement that is kind of making its way. I think the, the rural revival, if you will, in terms of some kind of alternative lifestyles outside of commodity farming. So, I mean, I've, I've had friends who you know, who've talked about you know moving out this way, and where one line is, it's between I'll have nobody to talk to, and they'll kill me. <laughs> now you knew you weren't going to get killed because your yeah. folks lived here. You had protection from a, a very yeah. well established family, but the the nobody to talk to. Is a is a scary thing. Yeah, yeah and I'm wondering how that how that played out for you. Yeah, it definitely takes some adjusting. There's definitely an adjustment period. Yeah, and there's truth to both ends of that spectrum that you just said. <laughs> yeah. But I think Justin can especially kind of um, talk to that because he wasn't didn't know what he was getting into necessarily when yeah. he went back. And I think that you know you could say that like you know you could say. You know, if you did like a word count, for example, every day, your daily word, the words that come out of your mouth that you're speaking to someone, they may be fewer, but I think the quality of conversation is much greater. So you, um, so I think it's, it's, it's all depends on how you define um, conversation and how you define sh human to human interaction. Um, you know, if you value, you know, if you value, you know, quality interaction, um, I think you really get that around here, just not all day, every day. Um, but, you know, I think that's part of the beauty for me, and it's just, you know, obviously the, the beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but I think for me that's what I've learned to appreciate is, you know, I would much rather see fewer people a day per day and, and be able to take the time to, to have a quality conversation and to, you know, to solve the world's problems. Um, you know, rather than, uh, rather than anything else. So, I think, um, yeah, there is definitely some truth in, uh, in the fact that you're you're more isolated. But, um, you know, you you can also, you can isolate yourself anywhere. Um, and then, and also the same applies with um, communicating and meeting people. You can do that anywhere as well. And, and the same thing holds true here. You just have to. Um, you just have to know where to look and, and where to, to put your efforts. And one thing that came to mind actually as Justin was saying that is I think in some um, respects in my generation probably and perhaps also because um, I moved away for a while and did come back, um, I, to some degree I think there's almost a, there's an expectation almost of um, me being perhaps being a little more alternative minded um, as I come back to this area and uh, for lack of a better way of saying it maybe I can, can um, perhaps get away with a few more <laughs> things just because of you know kind of not only my generation but also that I've left and come back and so People, I think, maybe do expect a few differences than maybe what are outside of the kind of traditional lifestyles or norms around here. So, yeah. we take advantage of that, I think. Yeah, we do. I know. <laughs> when we can. Yeah, we do, because we don't shy away from, um, I mean, people already know to a large extent that we are, you know, anomalies, if yeah. you will. And so we, you know, we don't shy away from um, proving that to people, I guess yeah. you could say. So at the same time, of course, I mean, we appreciate and absolutely respect the the traditional, the lifestyles that people have always lived here, yeah, and that, yeah. that they are, and that's one of the things we love. But we also just appreciate the diversity of, you know, others who might be doing things a little out of the norm. So, 
I, I mean, I can't resist asking what counts as out of the norm. I mean, kind of what kinds of wild and crazy things you guys yeah. do here? Yeah, I'd get in trouble if I started down this path. <laughs> Oh, I, maybe they're not that crazy, but I maybe just in terms of... Um, just not conforming to social expectations, Our interests. I, I mean, we, yeah, we kind pursuing. of joke that, we joke actually that we have a number of African masks and jewelry on our walls here, and so we kind of joke to say we're probably the only one in this county and several counties around that have African decor on our walls, or we're maybe listening to some reggae music out in the mm-hmm. woodshop. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that we've been lucky enough to be able to, I guess, somewhat have the freedom of choice to pursue what we're really passionate about and what we really enjoy doing. And so I think in that way, that's, I think that's what we do that um, sort of puts us outside of the box or outside of the norm because most people don't necessarily have the freedom of choice to do what they want to do. They need to, they do what they have to do to pay the bills and, um, and that does not, of course, does not necessarily mean that they enjoy what they do, and so I think that um, in that way we do um, stuff out of out of the box yeah. or out of the norm because we're doing something we really enjoy, and it's you know it's a lot of sixty-hour weeks, and you know it's a lot of it's a huge challenge, but at the end of the day, it's worth it's totally worth it. I mean, we wouldn't we wouldn't have it any other way. And we'd have a Subaru, which is also out of the norm. <laughs> Yeah. We have two, so I think <laughs> you know when we're coming, yeah. and you know where where we are if we're in Lamberton. You know uh, what, what store we're at. Yeah. everyone knows that car. <laughs> uh, yeah. So you were, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about you've got this at reference point Africa, and you were educated enough to know some things about what you were seeing. In Africa, and you also did a lot of a lot of different things while you were there, mm-hmm. and I'm wondering how how that experience is kind of a lens for stuff you see here. I mean, do you get Africa flashbacks? Do you get mm-hmm. weird Africa connections yeah. or disconnections or uh, you know? I mean, I'm just curious because it you no. Know, that's the really original thing. Nobody else around here has Africa as a frame of reference for yeah. Southwest yeah. Minnesota. Absolutely. That's true. I mean, in some ways, it's it's hard to find an aspect of life, of daily life, that does, that we don't in some way relate to our time in Niger, I think. Yeah, or, or doesn't somewhat determine our behavior to, yeah. or our attitude towards something. I think um, it's kind of a hard question to really put into words, but um, there's a lot of aspects coming from comparing a rural lifestyle and a small, close-knit agricultural community here versus that in Niger. There's a lot of similarities um, in terms of, you know, people being really heavily relying on one another emotionally, financially, socially, um, everyone knowing everyone else's business for better or worse, things like that are just, those are, I think, across human nature, especially in rural areas. Mm -hmm. Those are true of of a lot of cultures. Um, But I guess in terms of physical environment, it just, it couldn't be more different. And so when we were sitting in 120 degree hot, dry, you know, desert days and pulling water that we had to filter and, you know, living with people who oftentimes didn't have enough to eat, um, you come back here to basically the agricultural heartland of North America probably with some of the best soils around and, you know, climate that's really comfortable and I mean, there's contrasts like that that we do our best to share with people, um, I think, but there's some things you just can't, you know, you just can't explain to people. Yeah, kind of transcends that. Yeah, definitely a lot of things, especially if you've lived here your whole life, you can't imagine. Um, You just can't imagine it, really. 
and whether or not you're interested in knowing, you know, it's, I don't know, <laughs> it's a challenge, it's a place that's very near and dear to us, but um, outside of our immediate family, most people here may not think of, you know, rarely, ever. They see pictures once in a while, and probably they aren't very representative of what life is like actually there, but they're probably not going to know any other. So we'll certainly share, we share experiences when we can, and we um, are quick to talk about how wonderful it was when we can, because... Um, people assume otherwise. Yeah, I think a lot of people think that we sacrificed two years of our lives and gave up everything to do that. Um, which you can say we did to a point, but we would be the first to tell you that we gained a lot more, we than, gained we a lot more than that, and yeah. you could almost call it selfish of us to have wanted to go somewhere like that, to learn so much, and really, you know, be a part of a, part of the people who had very little, but who shared whatever they did have with us, so we consider ourselves lucky, one of, some of the lucky few to have been able to do that. Mm. Were, were, are there, you know, as, as a geographer, I mean, no, we, what are the odds, you know, traveling with a geographer to rural Minnesota is part of what's essentially a geography project. Uh, what are the odds of running into a, a geographer? I know. I, I, it's two just, geographers. Yeah, that. yeah, two ge I'm sorry, two geographers. Yes, but but I, 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 I mean, I'm thinking of you as a carpenter, of course. I mean, that's right. your training also. Uh, are there things, you know, putting on your geographer's hat, for a second, are there things that you think about, or things that you, you know, I mean, you have a, you have a, a way, of, a, a possibility for thinking about what's going on out here, mm -hmm. that, and and with some contrast cases and with some different, that that is pretty rare out here. Yeah, what yeah. what kind of what what stuff goes on between your ears <laughs> in your in your geographer's mode? I constantly think about the, how interconnected things are, I guess. I mean, just physically with the, you know, the national um, road system. I always think of just of the ease of connectivity is something that always strikes my mind because there's a lot, of, a lot of big trucks and stuff that come through town and there's, you know, literally tons of grain being hauled off every direction, every, you know, 24-7. And so that's something, you know, in my, I guess, geography mind that I always think about. Um, it's just how, you know, I'll, if I take a right turn, I'm, you know, I can go 1,500 miles across the country. And if I take a left, I can go 1,500 the other direction. And it's just, just that easy. Um, I don't, yeah, I don't know. One of the things that strikes me, I mean, really, the fact that you can get in your car, drive 150 miles, and be in a, what feels like a different world in the middle of Minneapolis is quite in of itself amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things I think that I I think of often, um, I'm continually looking at things and I'm, I'm kind of saying, I, I'm looking for the reasons in the history as to why they've become what they have. And I don't necessarily think that's a viewpoint that someone who's lived here their entire life was never left you know, yeah. takes on things, whether it's um, just community organizing or different social events or interests that people have around here, and all those kinds of things, religious backgrounds, all those things to me, I look at it from the point of view as historically how that's come to be, not just that's how it is, but how it come to be, and the simple fact that um, because of where you are, where you were born on this earth, that's determined a lot about you. <laughs> you mentioned the five generation uh, farm and the, the, the whole whole business of carrying on a heritage or carrying on a legacy. And I'm, I'm curious what the content of that is for you. I mean, in what way you see yourself kind of passing on a, a real legacy to your daughter. Sure. Um, I think 
in its simplest sense, that's physically being, you know, at, in, at our family's roots where it all began. So I am fifth generation, uh, my father being the fourth. And physically being here on the land, on that farm site where it all began, is in the simplest way, you know, just having Amana grow up to know that. <coughs> Excuse me, to know that area, to know the land herself, and to know how we're living off of it. Um, that's where it starts. And then beyond that, I, there's a lot of um, traditions that my parents, even in their generation, I think, especially have hung on to that maybe others in, theirs, others in their generation have left, whether it's... Um, picking apples and pressing, you know, using an old wooden press to make apple juice, or raising hens, you know, egg-laying hens and having chickens and picking eggs every day. Um, composting and planting native berries. Tapping um, our maple trees. Tapping maple trees and doing our own maple syrup run, run every springtime. Um, those are all the kinds of things that even when I was growing up, were probably quite unique to my family, to what we were doing. Um, and I didn't necessarily know that at the time. And now it's perhaps even more unique, you know, in, in our daughter's generation to still be seeing those things through. Mm -hmm. And to know, to understand that a pickle comes from a cucumber that you pick in the garden and to know where that gallon of milk is coming from and you know how the egg got in that carton those are all things that I I don't want her to not know when she's growing up what she does with it of course is up to her when she's yeah. older but I want her to know those things that my family has always known yeah. um, it's a really idyllic picture you painted uh, a bit of, I'm not considering moving anytime soon. I grew up on a farm. I left for a reason. Left. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was, but, but when, when I left, my parents bought, bought machinery. Before that, we did it all by hand. So it's a little bit closer to your African example. Sure. What, I, what I'm curious about, though, is what's been hardest for you coming back? Um, I think that a lot of it is it's a couple things. A lot of it's the um, cultural diversity that isn't here nearly as much. It's not to say you can't seek it out, um, but certainly not, you know, if you're in a metro area, cultural events and just meeting people from different walks of life with different interests. That's something I miss most of all. And um, I also miss it being... In, being quite young, I think, out here, we don't have nearly the same number of young people our age with small, you know, with small children and um, growing families um, versus, you know, most, most people out here, the majority of the population is retired or close to retirement, and that's definitely been a big challenge as well, so it comes down to social aspects for us and kind of the cultural diversity, but one thing we do when we perhaps we are feeling a little stir crazy, need to get out, go do something, um, we kind of remind ourselves we can always go to whether it be you know the Twin Cities area for the weekend and get our dose of a fun music concert, you know, or some other like venue or something that sounds interesting to us. Um, we can go and do that, and we can come back to a daily life that we really appreciate. Nine days out of ten, I would rather be here and make that drive to go to go to these other scenes that I need to see versus um, being in a, a really densely populated area. I would be wishing, I know that the grass is always greener, I know that if I were there, you know, at times enjoying that diversity that's there, I'd be, I'd be looking for wide open spaces and a nice big lawn for our kids that are running around them.